are so glad to have each and every one of you with us today at Enoch Creek Church. And if you are visiting for the very first time, we are so glad to have you with us. We want to extend a very special welcome to you. Thank you so much for being with us today in worship. Amen. I pray that this will be the first uh, of many visits, and I pray that maybe you come home, folks, with us. We would love to have you with us as we worship Jesus Christ in spirit and in truth. Amen. And as we get started today, I want to make a few announcements. Of course, I want to welcome you out or invite you out to Sunday school that starts at 10 o'clock every Sunday morning for all ages. Then worship at 11, service on Sunday nights at 6 p.m. And also on Wednesday nights at 7 p.m. We'd love to have you in our classes on Wednesday night. Next, I'll go ahead and tell you this next Sunday night or next Sunday, which is Easter Resurrection Sunday, I invite you to come out and to be with us, especially as we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior. But also, I'll go ahead and tell you, next Sunday night, there will be no evening service. And also, next Sunday morning is going to be a very special day because of our kids' choir uh, will be coming, and they're going to be performing next Sunday morning. Uh, we'll sing maybe a congregation song or two, and the kids' choir is going to have the rest of the time. And then I'm going to share a little bit at the end. So, but please come out and be with us next Sunday as we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior. Um, also, today is Palm Sunday, whether you know about know that or not. Today is Palm Sunday. It's the day we, we celebrate is when Jesus came riding into Jerusalem on that colt. As he prepared, he was making his way to the cross. It was his final trek uh, to Calvary in that week. And this morning I'll be preaching a little bit on that. And we were supposed to have our resurrection celebration this afternoon, but that is canceled today. That resurrection celebration, the Easter egg hunt, and the bounce house, that is going to be canceled today because of the weather. According to why I've watched it, and I watched it, and I watched it until 8 o'clock this morning, and then finally made the decision that we don't have to postpone it because about 3 and 4 o'clock, that's exactly when the weather is supposed to be hitting and raining. And we're not going to bring it inside. We did that with the fall festival. It was last minute, and it was it was just too much. So we're going to postpone it. And our plan is to reschedule it on April the 28th. Is that's the two weeks from today? It'll be the week after uh, Easter. But please, if that works out, that is our plans to do it. We've already got the eggs and the candy and all this good stuff. So we'll have to to reschedule. Amen. And pray that it works out for that particular Sunday. Amen. So pray for that. But it, we did cancel that, so if you bake something, you might have to stick it in the freezer till, for two weeks, amen? Uh, or, or you can go ahead and eat it and bake another one between now and then. That's up to you, amen? But uh, please remember that, that note that there, it's canceled. We are having church this evening, though. Don't let me forget that. We are having church at 6 tonight. Um, because I'm going to give you all next Sunday night. I can't give you all two Sunday nights in a row. Y'all wouldn't know what to do. We don't do that around here. So we do have church tonight at 6 p.m. as normal, and then we'll pick up, of course, Wednesday night and go on and hopefully reschedule our, our Easter egg hunt uh, coming up later in the month. Amen. So remember that. Also, Kids Choir are, is going to be practicing to this morning after church. If they are part of Kids Choir, please plan to be with them. Uh, stay after church. Lunch will be provided, and you can pick them up after they practice. Um, also, the Happy Seniors of Faith want me to announce this. This Thursday, April 18th, from 11 to 2, they will be uh, meeting. They're going to have their food, their fellowship, and the Word. Please plan to come to be with them. All adults are invited. Also, our family night, which is the last Wednesday night of the month. If you'd like to help bring food for that, you can sign up also in the hallway. And the women's ministry will be having a vintage tea party on May the 11th. And there's one more thing right here, Brotherhood. Our, our men's ministry will be having a skeet shoot on Saturday, April the 27th. So write that down, men. All you need to bring is your shotgun and some shells. Uh, we'll provide the skeets and the throwers and things like that. And we'll have food after that. A plan to be with us for, for uh, the skeet shoot. Rosie said, thank you for all the volunteers, for the for the nursery workers, all that you do. She said, but we always need more, amen. So if you would like to volunteer for that, they would greatly appreciate that to spread the load around a little bit 
it makes it a lot easier for everybody. Amen. At this time, we're going to receive our morning offering. If, if the busters, if my men would come and we get ready to receive our morning offering, I'll again remind you to, to check out the prayer list that's on the back of your morning bulletin. And be mindful of those that are standing in need of prayer. And if you see somebody that is out, if you see somebody, if you know somebody that's sick, let me encourage you to take that bulletin and, or take that, uh, take their name, call them, check on them, and tell them that we miss them, that we'd love to see them back in the house of the Lord. Amen. And let's go to the Lord in prayer. We're going to bless these tithes and offerings as we faithfully give unto the Lord this morning. Brother Darrell, would you pray this morning and bless the offering? Dear Lord God, we love you, and we thank you for another time to come into your house. Thank you, Lord, for your love and your mercy. Every day that we ask that you touch and bless these kinds of offerings. Bless all that has to give and all that don't. Lord, bless the knowing all the preaching and singing going on here today. We pray that you be glorified and lifted up. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. As you give this morning faithfully, worship with Sister Jade, and she's going to bring our special worship to this morning.
next song before I speak. Just ask you, choir, you can stand. I'm going to ask y'all to stay seated for just a minute. I want you to listen to the words of this, the first two verses that Brother Tim is going to sing. I want you to listen to these words. This is what really I'm going to be preaching on today is the, the man of sorrows, the suffering Savior. And I want you to listen about it. Listen to it. And then I want you to join us when we get to the course, if you will, okay? Man of sorrows, Lamb of God, by His own betrayed. The sin of man and wrath of God has been on Jesus' way. 
rain pouring down, washing them in that precious blood. Amen. I'm so thankful that my debt is clear. I don't know about you. Amen. Let's declare that this old rugged cross is my salvation. Jesus 
came riding in uh, to Jerusalem on a colt that had never been ridden before. And as he came riding into Jerusalem that day, they really rolled out the red carpet for Jesus. They were taking off their coats and they were laying them down in the streets. They were breaking off palm branches and they were waving them in the air and they were declaring, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. And they exclaimed louder and louder as Jesus was making his way into Jerusalem on that day. Day. But this is the thing. Many of them were looking for Jesus to come as an earthly king. They were looking for Jesus to lead them in a revolt, a victorious overthrowing of the power of Rome uh, that was over Israel at that time. They were looking for an earthly ruler, but Jesus did not come to be that. He was not riding in uh, uh, there to be an earthly king or a, to, a, a leader to revolt against the power of Rome. But that's not why Jesus came. Jesus was journeying to the cross. He was making his final days, his final steps of, that were leading him to a place where he would suffer and he was going to die. And as he journeyed to that cross, he shed his precious blood for the sins of the world so that we might have forgiveness. And that's what I want to speak to you about today. Only this would be a very good sermon for a Good Friday. If we had a Good Friday service, the day in which Jesus was crucified, where we talk about the sufferings of our Savior. And this morning, we're going to go back to Psalms chapter 22. It is a psalm that King David wrote. And these words are beautiful and they are precisely portray, they precisely portray the sufferings of our Messiah. But I want you to get this. What's going to make our text more amazing is that they were written roughly a thousand years before the cross. What we're going to read today is not where David saw Jesus crucified and then he wrote about it. But what we're going to see, what we're going to hear is what David wrote thousands or hundreds of years before Jesus ever went to the cross. How is that possible? It's because David, moved by the Holy Spirit, wrote these words down before they ever happened. Amen. And it constitutes as one of the most amazing predictions and prophecies of all time that the Messiah would suffer and die for the sins of the world. I want us to look, we're going to take this verse by verse as I speak about it today, and we're going to point out some of the sufferings of Christ as he was on the cross. And I want you to think about this. Think about the things that Jesus went through for you and for me as you sit there today. Psalms chapter 22, let's begin in verse 1. As we talk about the first one that I want to point out, he was forsaken by God. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me and from the words of my groaning? Oh, my God, I cry in the daytime, but you do not hear. And in the night season am I and am not silent, but you are holy. Let me stop right there. I don't want to go any further in verse 2. In the night season I am silent. Let me read it again because I stumbled all the way through it. Let me look at my Bible here. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me? And from the words of my groaning, Oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but you do not hear. And in the night season, I am not silent. He says, why have you forsaken me? Do those words sound familiar to you? If you've ever heard the Easter story, or the resurrection story, and the story of the cross, you've probably heard those words before. Jesus exclaimed them as he was on the cross of Calvary. It's recorded in Matthew chapter 27. He says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But when Jesus declares this and he asks this in the Gospels later on, Jesus was not in doubt or in confusion about what was happening. Let me make it clear why Jesus said that. Jesus quotes this while he is on the cross. He quotes this, of course, to fulfill prophecy. But it was not that he didn't understand what was happening or that the Father had some way rejected him. It is certain that God approved his work. It is certain that Jesus was innocent. It was certain that he had done nothing to forfeit the favor of God. And as God's son, he was holy, he was undefiled, he was obedient, and God the Father still loved him. 
In none of these ways did God the Father reject Jesus or forsaken Him. But yet, the Bible tells us that Jesus became sin for us. Listen to what Isaiah prophesied, chapter 53, verse 6. And all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. The Apostle Paul put it like this, Galatians <coughs> chapter 3. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it's written, cursed is anyone who hangs on a tree. In other words, Jesus became a curse for us. Remember, if you go back to Genesis, G, the, the Bible says that man was cursed because of their sin in the, in, in the Garden of Eden, weren't they? They were cursed because they disobeyed God. Guess what? Jesus took that curse upon himself when he went to the cross. And in that moment, as Jesus hung on the cross bearing the sins of the world, he knew what it was like to be separated from the Father. As the wrath of God was being poured out upon our Savior, as he hung on that old rugged cross, do you know what he felt? He literally felt the chasm, the gap that was between God and man. He literally felt that distance. He knew what it was like to be desolate and alone and unconscious of the Father's presence. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He knew what it felt like in that moment to be separated from God. Can I tell you something, friend? If you're outside of Christ today, if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, the gap filler, and you are separated from God, you're far from Him. Notice this text says that He cries out day and night. You say, Pastor, how does that apply to Jesus in this text? That He cries out day and night. Jesus was on the cross for about six hours. They put him on there about nine in the morning. They took him off that afternoon around three o'clock. When they put him on the cross, it was day. But by noon, the sky was dark. The Bible says this in, in Luke chapter 23. And now it was about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. I want you to notice that. It says all the earth. All the earth, not just in Jerusalem, but my Bible says all the earth. I take that literally. You may not, but I do. Then the sun was darkened and the veil of the temple was torn. When Jesus was on that old rugged cross, can I tell you something? The sun refused to shine. Amen. As he was bearing the sins of the world. To so understand that it was in the day he cried out and in the night. <coughs> Because the sun refused to shine as the Son of God was hanging on the cross. And even though that Jesus cried out, God the Father remained silent. And Jesus for a moment felt separated from God's presence. He knew what it was like to be forsaken as he hung on that rugged cross. That's why he says that. Let's go a little bit further in the Psalms going back to verse 3 of Psalms. But then we've got a little three little phrases verses right here that gives us a hint that he was not forsaken. It says, but you are holy, enthroned in the praises of Israel. All fathers trusted in you. They trusted and you delivered them. I'm going to say that again. They trusted and you delivered them. They cried out to you and were delivered. They trusted in you and were not ashamed. Why is those three verses right there in the middle of this talking about the sufferings of Christ? Here he is. He opens up. He says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And we might come to the conclusion, what did God the Father forsake Christ as he was on the cross? No, those verses right there allow or remind us that God had not forsaken him, but that he was faithful. And even though he might have been silent as his son hung on that cross, God the Father was not absent. He had not forsaken Jesus in his sufferings. And after his sufferings, he would deliver him. He would resurrect him from the grave on the third day. You know what? Sometimes I'm going to really just, I'm not going to do a lot of application today. A lot of times 
I'll teach the scripture and then I'll apply it to our lives. I'm not going to do a lot of that. I want to specifically just talk about the sufferings of Jesus today. But many times we may go through things in our life and we may ask, well, God, have you forsaken me? Have you left me? Where are you at, God, in the midst of my sorrows? Those verses right there tell me that God hasn't forsaken you, even though he may be silent. There are certain things you have to allow to be fulfilled and to happen. And sometimes those things are sorrowful. They are painful. And they push us to the brink of breaking. But God was faithful in the midst of it all. Even though Christ had to endure what he did. And because of the curse, he had felt that separation of God and man. God was still present. Amen. God was not absent. Let's go a little bit further. Jesus understood what it meant to be forsaken or to be separated from God. He also experienced this. He was treated as a criminal. Jesus was treated as a criminal, as a mere nothing, as we're about to see in this text. Let's look at verse 6. But I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men and despised by the people, all of those who see me ridicule me. They shoot out the lip. They shake their head saying, He trusted in the Lord. Let Him rescue Him. Let Him deliver Him since He delights in Him. Notice that verse 6 starts with this. I am a worm and no man. What does that say? Then? As David writes his words, I am a worm and I am no man. Jesus was seen. And Jesus was treated as less than a human. Our Savior was treated in such an inhumane way that we cannot even begin to describe it in words today. He was treated as a mere worm. You ever thought about it? Anybody ever been fishing before? You get your box in a big old pond, juicy pond worms, and you take that hook and you thread that worm on that hook, don't you? And you don't think too much about it, do you? Why? Some of you do. Some of you are, I ain't touching that. But for most of us, if you go fishing, you'll take that hook and you will run it through that worm and you won't think a thing about it. Why? Because it's just a worm. It doesn't matter. They saw Jesus in the same way as they ran those nails through his hands. They saw him as nothing. He don't matter. His words, they noticed they mocked his words. Oh, he, he, he believed in God. Let God save him. They saw him as a nothing. Jesus was saw as a nothing, as a nobody, as a worm. You think nothing about it. It's just a worm. It was, he was meaningless to them, and they pierced him through his hands and through his feet. It didn't bother them one bit as they nailed those, run those nails through his hands. You know what? Jesus endured great physical pain, but yet he endured emotional pain and rejection that was just equally as torturous. Not only was he rejected as Messiah, but he was just rejected as a person. He was a worm to them. Yeah. He was despised and rejected. Isaiah prophesied that this would also be in Isaiah chapter 53. He is despised and rejected by men. A man of sorrows. That's what we were just singing, isn't it? And acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. That backs up what David wrote, isn't it? He was just a worm to them. A nothing. He was despised. He was rejected. We didn't esteem him. We didn't look upon him in honor or glory. But we just looked at him as a nothing and a nobody. That's what your Savior experienced. Furthermore, they mocked him and he hung on that cross. They would walk by him and with their lips they'd yell, Save yourself! <laughs> Go on and come on down on that cross. Oh, you miracle worker. You that done all these mighty things. Oh, if you're God, if you're the Son of God, why don't you just come out on down? Amen. Matthew 27 backs that up. It says, it quotes Matthew or Psalms chapter 22. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now if he will have him. For he said, I am the Son of God. We know that as Jesus even hung on the cross of Calvary, one of the malefactors 
that was on the one of the one side of him. The, the man that's being crucified next to Jesus even ridiculed Jesus. Said, hey, if you're Jesus, if you're this Savior, why don't you save yourself and save me too? Remember right after that, the other one told him to hush. He said, we deserve this, but Jesus didn't deserve it. He was treated as a mere criminal. Treated as a nothing and a nobody. That's what Jesus went through as he went to the cross for you and for me. Number three, he was completely deserted. He was completely deserted. Let's look a little bit further in verses 9 through 11. But you are he who took me out of the womb. You made me trust while my mother, on my mother's breast. I was cast upon you from birth. From my mother's womb, you have been my God. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help me. I'm going to focus on that last part of those two verses. For there is none to help me. You know that Jesus ministered a little over three years, walking, going from place to place, place to place, ministering, teaching to thousands. I've gotten to probably the largest number of people, not including Facebook, goes out. Maybe three, four hundred people that I've ever preached to. But we know that when Jesus fed the multitude with just a few loaves of bread and two fish, we know there was 5,000 men there at that one meeting. Jesus preached to thousands in that very short amount of time. He healed just as many the Bible talks about Jesus did so many miracles, so many mighty works, that they all the books in the world cannot contain what Jesus did. John says that. His disciples walked with him for three years. But yet, when he was arrested and taken into council and taken to these courts, no one stood up for him. No one was there willing to die with him. Or for him. Amen. Nobody. The only one that really said anything was Pilate. And Pilate told the masses, he says, look, this man has done nothing to be worthy of death. But they continued to yell, crucify, crucify, crucify. Where were all these people that worshipped him and yelled and hollered as he was coming in on Palm Sunday? Where are all these people that witnessed the miracles and, and witnessed the, uh, the mighty works that he did? Where were the disciples? Not one of them was standing up, I'll die with my Jesus. Not one. You understand that? Not one. Not one said, I'll die with him. Nail me to a cross beside him. He's not, not one. He was completely deserted. John chapter, Jesus said that was going to be in John chapter 16. He says this, Indeed, the hour is coming, yes, has now come, that you will be scattered, each to his own, and will leave me alone. All those on the earth would leave him alone and would forsake him. He was utterly forsaken. Not only had the disciples forsaken him, but those that praised him riding into Jerusalem were gone. They were nowhere to be found. There was none to help. Oh, the loneliness that our Savior must have experienced. I want you to imagine for just a moment not having a soul on earth that was willing or able to help you. We cannot even begin to fathom that because you've got family, you may have a spouse, you may have a child, you may have some. Imagine not having one soul on the earth that you could call on or could count on. Completely and utterly alone, deserted. Yes, Lord. We can't even comprehend that. That's what Jesus experienced on his way to Calvary. Let's go a little further, verses 12 through 13. I just hope you think. I bring this out today because I, I want you to realize what Jesus went through for you. Amen. I think sometimes while we died on the cross, we forget everything that he went through, church, for us. The suffering and the sorrow, and it just becomes a story to us. Oh, yeah, we believe it. But I'm telling you, I pray that just through some of the words and just reading this psalm today, that our hearts would be broken afresh and anew today with what Jesus did in his sacrifice for us. 
Let's read verses 12 and 13 together. Many bulls have surrounded me. Strong bulls of fashion have encircled me. They gape at me with their mouths like a raging and a roaring lion. You remember as Jesus died on the cross, he was surrounded by religious leaders. These men that ruled in their generation, these men that thought surely they had won. They had gotten rid of this man that was going to start a rebellion. And not only that, but he was surrounded by men of darkness. I personally believe, I personally believe the devil himself was there as Jesus was dying on that cross that day. But let's go a little bit further. I'll read verses 14 and 15. It says this, I am poured out like water. I am poured out like water. All of my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It has melted within me. My strength is dried up like pot sugar. And my tongue clings to my jaw. That reminds me, I need some water too. <laughs> you have brought me to the dust of death. What a description. What a description David gives as being completely exhausted from the cross. The fourth thing that I want to point out to you is Jesus went to the cross. He was completely and utterly exhausted. In his moral state, as it was God in the flesh, as he carried the cross, as he was beaten with that cat of nine tail, and he hung on the cross, he was complete, he gave everything that he had to give. He said, I am poured out like water. If I was to take this water and just to pour it, I'm empty. I can empty this bottle if I pour it out. In other words, he said, I'm empty. I have given everything that I have to give physically. I'm poured out like water. If you remember, as Jesus was going to the, he was going up Calvary, he was carrying the cross after he had been beaten. If you remember, he completely collapsed under the weight of the cross. And a man by the name of Simon of Serene was ordered to help Jesus to carry his cross the rest of the way. He said, I am poured out like water. And David is writing all of this hundreds of years before it ever happened. Amen. But he's given this beautiful illustration of what Jesus was going to go through. He says, I'm empty. I've given everything to you that I can give. I've given it all unto you. It goes on to say my bones are out of joint. My bones are out of joint. But now the Bible specifically tells us that not one bone in Jesus' body was broken. Not one. But David says, my bones are out of joint. Well, how could that be? I want you to understand, when Jesus hung on the cross, as his hands were nailed to either side and his feet, he literally hung on the nails. He was so exhausted that he could not carry the cross. And as he hung there on those nails, he would have been so exhausted, he would not have even been able to hold himself up. And so literally... He would have hung from his hands. And his, the, the stretch and the weight that would have been on his shoulders, his neck and his back, as the weight of his body was just bearing down upon him. The weight of his own body, literally, do you know what was happening? was literally suffocating him. Amen. That's what happens when you're crucified. Literally, from your own weight pressing down upon your diaphragm, you cannot breathe. And you literally suffocate after your legs give out. My joints have been pulled because he was literally being pulled by the weight of his own suffering body. And he's gasping for breath. He says, my strength, or my heart is melted. My strength has dried up. My tongue clings to my jaw. David got that one right on too, didn't he? Because we know that Jesus was on the cross. He said, I thirst. I thirst. And they gave him sour wine. To drink. This is what Christ experienced, church, as he hung on that cross. Amen. Don't you ever think lightly of what Jesus did for you. Amen. He was completely exhausted. He gave everything he had to give. Number five, his hands and feet were pierced. Let's look at verse 16. For dogs have surrounded me. 
The congregation of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierce my hands and my feet. I can count all of my bones. They look and stare at me. They divide my garments among them. And from my clothing they cast lots. I want you to just get really how prophetic this is. I can't stress that enough. I you to get how prophetic that was in what David says here about crucifixion. And this, this lets me know that there is no book like the Bible on the face of the planet. Right. There is no book like the Bible on the face of the planet. I want you to keep this in mind. That David lived almost a thousand years B.C. before Christ. He's writing this in that time period. Understand. I was doing a little research on this and digging up about crucifixion. And I wanted to know when did cruci crucifixion, the cross, when did this type of torture, when did this type of execution come to be? And according to what I studied and looked up, as far as history tells us, crucifixion did not exist in David's day. Understand that crucifixion being Killed on a cross, which did not exist in David's day. Historians believe, this is what I looked up, that crucifixion originated with the Assyrians and the Babylonians, but they are certain that it was used in the Persian in the 6th century B.C. That is still several hundred years after David. But yet David gives the perfect illustration by saying, My hands and my feet are pierced. It was not anything that he saw. It's what the Holy Spirit moved upon him and he pinned. Let me tell you, if Jesus is who he is, church, based on just fulfilled Bible prophecy, understand the Bible didn't just fall out of heaven like this. Understand it's made up of many books over a hundred, a, a, a 1,500 years and it's all been put together for me and you. But Psalms was written hundreds of years before the New Testament. But God laid it on David's heart. His hands and feet would be pierced. The Spirit moved upon him and gave him this description of the man of sorrows. Isaiah also prophesied in Isaiah chapter 53. He says this. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did not esteem him uh, stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted, but he was wounded. Some translations say they're pierced for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement upon, uh, of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. They would give a beautiful illustration of what the cross would, that was coming before he even knew what it was. Notice there in that verse 16, it says this, that he was surrounded by dogs. Now, did David literally mean dogs, boof, barking dogs? If you was here on Wednesday night a few weeks ago, we talked about this and how dogs was a term that Jewish people would use to talk about Gentiles. So what is he talking about there that I'm surrounded by dogs? He wasn't talking about literal dogs. He was talking about Gentiles. He was talking about Romans. And Roman soldiers were surrounding him the day and the moment that he died. Brother Mark goes on to say that they stripped him. He was naked. We always see Jesus portrayed as he was had something over him. Jesus would have hung naked on that cross. There would have been nothing that was cover him, covering him whatsoever. He says, I can count all of my bones. I see everything. They look and they stare at me. He was naked as he hang, hung on that cross. And the crowning indignity was this, that at the foot of the cross, as Jesus is suffering and dying for the sins of the world, guess what's going on at the foot of the cross? Roman soldiers are casting lots for his garment, his seamless garment. They were more concerned about the garment than they were the life of Jesus. To them, he was a worm. He was nothing. He was worthless. Church, this is what Jesus had to endure for you and me. This was the sum of the sorrows that Jesus had to go through. But let me tell you, it was only for a short season because Christ was delivered 
into the hands of the Father. Remember, he said, I commit my spirit into your hands. Verses 19 and 21 go on to say, this is the last part. But you, O Lord, do not be far from me, O my strength. Hasten to help me. Deliver me from the sword. Deliver me, or my precious life, from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth and from the horns of the ox. And, and this, my Bible's got a little pause, and it says, You have answered me. And then we see a turning and a difference in the, lot, the following verses right here that we're not going to get into today, but probably next Sunday morning. As he hung on that cross, he sought to be delivered. Notice it says, the, from the sword. That rope represents Roman authority. From the dogs, we just talked about that. That was the Gentiles. From the lion's mouth. You remember what we talked about, or we I preached before about how uh, Satan is represented. Peter says this, as a roaring lion seeking him, he may what? Devour. How does he devour? With the mouth. Satan was present there. And it says from the horns of the oxen. Not the oxen, but the horns of the oxen. When I think about an oxen, I think about horns. You know what I think about? I think about being gouged with those horns. I'll tell you a story real quickly. When we were a kid, we went to a cow pasture, and something was wrong with the truck. I was with some friends of mine, and so I was filling with the battery cables trying to get it fixed. And about the time that I thought I had it, they started yelling and screaming that the bull was coming. And so I literally busted my head on the hood of the truck, trying to get up in the hood of the truck away from the bull. In other words, I was afraid of the horns, because those horns are gouging, right? Think about it. Christ was gouged with those nails in his hands. But then it says this, deliver me from these things. And he said, you have answered me. Jesus was delivered from those things the moment that he gave up his spirit and placed it in the hands of the Father. Jesus was the suffering servant. Jesus went through hell on earth for you and me. Jesus did this all for the worst sins of the world. He suffered greatly to bring salvation unto you and to me. Oh, how we, church, should never be ashamed of our Savior. Amen. I said, church, we should never be ashamed of who Jesus is. Amen. Amen. We should never be ashamed. Oh, how he deserves our praise. When you see people get emotional and they begin to lift their hands and worship, let me tell you, don't think that they're a fool, amen. They just love their Jesus, amen. You might do it silently, that's okay. But I'm here today to say that our Savior is deserving of our worship. He's deserving of our love. He's deserving of our obedience. If He died for us in this way, my goodness, can we not live for Him? What He went through for us. We take it so lightly, I'm afraid, that we miss the point. Well, it's so sad that many still, they hear this story, they reject him as they did in that same day. They mock his name. They even curse his name. We look at him oftentimes as a myth, a fabricated lie that has never gone away. But I'm here today to tell you Jesus is no lie and that he is the truth. He is the way, the truth, and the life today. He is it. tell you that he's not the suffering Savior anymore either. He has been delivered from that suffering. It says, yes, you have you answered me, you have delivered. Jesus is not the suffering Savior anymore. Because God the Father and the Holy Spirit resurrected him on the third day. We'll get into that today. Next week, he is no longer the suffering Savior, but now he is the eternal glorified Savior. And he is at the right hand of God the Father, continually making intercession for you and I. And as he said in Revelation, I am alive and alive forevermore. Amen. Never will he ever experience or taste of death ever again. Glory. Ever. And as the children of God, I'm telling you this morning, we can celebrate in His sufferings. We can rejoice today for what Jesus went through. We can rejoice because through His sufferings, there's been many blessings poured out upon us. If I was to go through them all, we'd be here for another hour, amen? And I know you don't want that. But by His sufferings, we're redeemed. He became a curse for us. We're no longer under the curse of sin. He became that curse. We're no longer separated from God. 
No longer forsaken, no longer distant from God because of what Jesus has done for us because He paid our debt of sin by redeeming us from the cross. He paid in His precious blood. I no longer have to fear death. I no longer have to fear hell because of what Jesus did. Not only that, but I'm made whole by His sufferings. He said, by your stripes we are healed. We are made whole. I believe that Jesus provides spiritual healing. I also believe He provides physical healing for our bodies. Amen. There are so many more blessings I won't even commend to say them. But church, I'm telling you, He deserves our worship. Yes, this morning. Come on to the music. Both him and Christ Savior. He deserves our obedience. He deserves us to be unashamed of, of Him. And let me say this, He deserves our heart. Just simply say it. He deserves our heart. Amen. Can I ask you a question as we close this morning? Does He have your heart? John said this, we love Him because He first loved us. You want to know why He went through all that suffering? Why He went to the cross? Why He felt forsaken? Why He was left to the altar? You know why? Because He loves you. Amen. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. That whosoever believes in him, this is the condition, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Jesus. Did, does he have your heart this morning? Amen. True. Think about that for a minute. Think about it and reflect and value on what he did for you. Will you bow your heads and close your eyes? If you want to play softly, that's fine. I want to ask you a question as we close this service. You've heard what Jesus Christ went through for you. As we remember his sacrifice, we remember how he suffered. We remember his emotional stress, how he physically was exhausted. He gave it all for you. But does he have your heart today? I want to ask you a question. Have, have you ever been saved? Have you ever given your heart and soul to Jesus? If not, if you say, today, Pastor, I want to be saved. I want to know Jesus as my Lord and Savior. That's you. Would you raise your hand and say, today I want to know that, I, that I'm saved. I want to give my heart to Jesus. Is there one in here today? Is there one? I see that hand. Anybody else? Yeah, I see those hands. You put them down. I want you to say this with me right here. This has nothing to do with exact words. Is there a special prayer? No. It all has to do with the position of your heart. In belief. That Christ is who He said He is. Church, I want everybody in here today, I want you to pray this prayer with me as we call on Jesus this morning. Will you do that with me? Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. I need your forgiveness. I believe that you died for me. I ask you right now to forgive me of all my sins. I give you my heart. I am yours. I ask you to give me the Holy Spirit as my inheritance. I make you my Lord and my Savior in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Lift your hands all over this place right now. that today right now, if you pray that prayer, not just because, oh, you prayed what Pastor Zach said, but if you pray that and you meant it from your heart today, Jesus, I believe I'm a sinner, I, but I believe that you died for me and I ask you to forgive me of my sins and to come into my life. And listen to me, when you confess the Lord Jesus, the Bible says this, that you shall be saved. Whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be be saved. Romans chapter 10 verse 13 and it also says that you will not be ashamed. He will not turn you away when you call upon His name. So I want you to know right now, if you profess that today with all of your heart and you meant it, according to the Word of God, the authority of God, I tell you today, you're redeemed, you are forgiven, you are saved and your sins have been washed away and the Bible says this, that the angels in heaven are rejoicing and also that your name is being written down on the last book of life. You just lose everything.
Listen to me. 